guess you could say. And so, yeah, this is my first time ever using Sleeper, and I did it on the recommendation of one of you who said that it would be fun to see me do a mock draft with one of these. And I will say it's quite satisfying to be able to make all your selections so quickly, uh, just because I'm so used to doing mock drafts with real people uh, in ESPN and Yahoo and with Sleeper. Um, all the mock drafts are with their, you know, their CPU. So, um, the three different mock drafts that I did, it was a, a 10 team, a 12 team, and a 14 team. So, they're quite big. And that's going to be quite a bit of analysis if I were to actually try and break down each and every pick to such a fine degree. So, I think I'm going to switch it up for this video. And I'm just going to give you a snapshot score of how I feel about the pick. I'm going to give you a thumbs up, a meh, or a thumbs down if I didn't like it, and I'll be grading my own picks. So, first up, let us take a look at uh, the 14 teamer. This was a 14 team PPR mock draft on Sleeper, and I was selecting from the three position. So, with my first round pick, number three overall, I went with Tyreek Hill of the Miami Dolphins. I would give this pick a thumbs up just because Tyreek Hill is one of those amazing wide receivers in the league that has on any given day the upside to give you a 30 point performance can absolutely torch a defense always on pace for 2,000 yards through a lot of last year he has definitely established his connection with Tua Tagovailoa, no doubt about it um and, you know, I think that he's going to be coming back with a bit of vengeance uh, because the Dolphins went out sorry last year. And Mike McDan McDaniels was not pulling any punches. He said, you know, we pay you all this money and this is how you perform in the playoffs. And I think Tyreek took it very well when he mentioned that on the podcast that he was on. But um, it is a fact that he's getting paid all this money and he did not show up when it mattered. So I think that he's going to be very effective. Um and looking to recreate or even build on the season he had last year. So, uh, yeah, very, very happy with this one. Then coming into the second round, uh, I have here Isaiah Pacheco, running back of the Kansas City Chiefs. And now keep in mind, this is 14 team, so it, it did take quite a while for it to get back to me. And I'll give this a, uh, a mid, it's an all right pick. I don't think that Isaiah Pacheco is the worst pick here. Obviously, I made it because I liked it better than the other options. My next options being uh, Stephon Diggs, Josh Allen, uh, Josh Jacobs, Mike Evans. And, you know, I felt like in a 14 team league, you do want to draft running backs closer to the top because you can get away with wide receivers later on, things like that. But it's important to get these, like, skilled players you like. So I went with Pacheco. I think that he has a very safe floor. Being on a pretty high-scoring Kansas City offense, I mean, it was okay last year. Uh, but it looks to improve this year with the addition of Hollywood Brown um, and Xavier Worthy. So I think that overall we're going to see more, like, goal line work from Pacheco. And we can also keep in mind that Clyde Edwards Hilaire, you know, is a non factor in this offense, and they let Jarek McKinnon walk, who was more involved in the passing game. And so that means hopefully more targets for Pacheco. He gets to eat those 47 or so um, touches that Clyde Edwards Hilaire, sorry, not Clyde Edwards, that Jarek McKinnon was taking from him last year. So an expanded role. No one really drafted to take any cut from him. And he's had back-to-back -back very productive playoff performances. Um, just both the last two years in the playoffs, he really stepped up. And I think the league values, or not the league, the Chiefs value what he brings to the table. So that's why they are bidding on him. And I think that I, I don't love his game. I don't think that he is one of the best rushers in the league. I'm not expecting them to be a rush-heavy offense. I don't think that he has the best hands or anything like that, but his, his floor is pretty safe. I think that he's an RB2 two finisher kind of guy. Then in the third round, uh, with a quick turnaround, I went with another running back. Uh, 
this one out of the Buffalo Bills being James Cook. Uh, James Cook. Honestly, very similar to Isaiah Pacheco. He's playing on an offense that, uh, on the contrary, looks to be a bit worse uh, with the loss of Gabe Davis and Stephon Diggs. Obviously doesn't have as much touchdown upside with Josh Allen being as effective as he is from like goal line um, looks. 6'6", six, six, big bodied guy, but James Cook, um, he also was an RB2 finisher last year, and I think that he has his work cut out for him this year with Damian Harris retiring and Naeem Himes joining the Cleveland Browns. We aren't seeing anyone um, that looks to be splitting touches with James Cook. I do think that he's going to be an every down back, and on top of that, I think the worst offense is going to lead to more dump off passes uh, so he might be able to get more targets more like catches at the very least I don't know about more yardage he might be less efficient but uh, in terms of like just easy catches from Josh Allen we might see an uptick of that if no one is available uh, downfield and if Josh Allen doesn't choose to just scramble it himself uh, but yeah um, the other picks and the next five was Debo, Patrick Mahomes, Jalen Waddle, Nico Collins, uh, Jalen Hurts, and like those were all fine. Um, but I felt like running back was more important of a position to try and secure here, and I think that James Cook is also uh, an all right pick. I, I don't love it, I don't hate it. I think that it's, it is fine to make. Then heading into the fourth round, um, this is where I picked up a running back off the Arizona Cardinals, uh, James Conner. Uh, yeah, again, it's an alright pick. I, I think that in 14 team, I'm, I'm really just looking for alright. I'm looking to build a team that I don't hate by the end of it. Um, and so with James Conner, he has been very productive in Arizona. Um, looking back two years ago, three years ago, he finished as the RB5, and then back to back years of being a top 24 running back in the league. He's maintained some value. Uh, behind him in the depth chart, we've got Amari Durka, Imara, Imani DiMarcata, and Trey Benson, who I wouldn't be super worried about. Yes, he was one of the first running backs taken off the board for this draft class, but it wasn't like super high uh, up in the overall draft picks. Nothing like a Saquon Barkley and Ezekiel Elliott or a first round draft capital. We didn't have anyone like that in this year's draft. It's a bunch of guys who are looking to be at the very best, like splitting touches. And I don't think that that is the case for Trey Benson. I feel like James Conner has good rushing ability and catching ability, and he's done well under Kyler Murray for many years. So I'm hoping that he is able to keep that together and provide value. I do think that this is a little high for him, but it, once again, it's just uh, didn't love the other options. I, I feel like I would rather have James Conner than David Montgomery and that's really... Oh wait, sorry. That's not who my next option was. The next couple of people right ahead of James Conner would have been Tank Dell, Zay Flowers, Kyle Pitts, Christian Kirk. I'm not sold on any of those more than James Conner. That's who I went with. Then adding into the fifth round, I took uh, Amari Cooper of the Cleveland Browns. This is my second wide receiver, and this is a pick that I like. I am pretty high on Amari Cooper in these drafts as of late. I think that in the Brown depth chart, he is going to be at the very top. Uh, all things considered, David Njoku, Elijah Moore, Jerry Judy. Last year, Amari Cooper was very solid, and he had nice numbers with Joe Flacco, but he actually, paying attention to his numbers with Deshaun Watson, in certain ways, like, they're actually slightly better. Uh, whereas the opposite was true for Njoku. Njoku was significantly boosted by a change in quarterback play to Flacco. Uh, and obviously Flacco kept the offense afloat, but under Deshaun Watson, Amari Cooper 
viable he was definitely a viable fantasy wide receiver two type on that lower end of the wide receiver two category but if we see a full season from Deshaun Watson which we have yet to see from the Cleveland Browns then Amari Cooper figures to have a solid year in fantasy and yeah I wouldn't mind going out and robbing him um as you'll see I did do a couple times uh, anywho after that we move into the sixth round and the sixth round I have selected Las Vegas Raiders tight end Brock Bowers uh, and I'll give this in it's an okay pick I, I don't hate it I don't love it Brock Bowers is not on my list of tight end to go um, go to's I would rather have other players at this position but in 14 team I just wasn't quick enough to go and get them uh, we already saw Evan Ingram, Kyle Pitts go off the board in round 5, Mark Andrews, Trey McBride, Dalton Kincaid, George Kittle go off the board in round 4, uh, and then Sam Laporta and Travis Kelsey in round 2, all of those capitals are just really high, I don't even, my mind doesn't really shift to tight end mode until like round 5, round 6, and yeah, I, I was just not paying attention, and the after I miss out on all the guys that I like, the real next range is like uh, Brock Bowers, Jake Ferguson, David Njoku, and I mean I like David Njoku in the playoffs, but that was with Joe Flacco. Jake Ferguson has the the upside of being on a like depleted Cowboys offense outside of C D Lamb. Uh, you've got C D Lamb, you've got him, and you've got Brandon Cooks and everyone else is just uh, not the the most appealing. And Dak likes Jake Ferguson in the end zone. Uh, and then Brock Bowers looks to be decently involved in this offense. He is a very talented guy. Not the worst thing to bet on rookie, you know, tight ends. Sam Laporta last year, you see how he planned out. Uh, even Trey McBride. Both of them were pretty nice fantasy options in their first year. Brock Bowers winning the John Lackey, John Mackey. John Mackey Award, John Mackey Award, uh, twice as a tight end, an honor that really hasn't been done, and, you know, even opposing coaches such as, like, Nick Saban have really talked up this guy for how productive he was at Georgia, man, I'm using that word way too much, uh, crutch word for real, but either way, I think that Brock Bowers, I'm fine to bet on him, I don't, it's not something that I'm actively pursuing, but the situation called for it, and I took him. Then, in round seven, went with Lad McConkey out of uh, Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Chargers. Big fan of this pick. I think that Lad McConkey is going to jump straight to the top of that depth chart in LA. He's really only competing with Josh Palmer, and uh, maybe it looks to be DJ Chark. DJ Chark was picked up by Los Angeles. Um, maybe Quentin Johnston. Either way, wide receiver three is iffy. I think two is solidly secured with Palmer, but with Mike Williams gone and Keenan Allen gone, the Chargers have a lot of vacated targets, and we know that Justin Herbert is a guy that can very easily throw for 4,000 to 4,500 yards, uh, even up to 5,000 yards, and those have to go somewhere. And with Ladd McConkey likely taking over in the slot, I think that he's going to be a funnel for those missing opportunities on that offense. And yeah, another Georgia stud, so we're going to take Ladd McConkey and not really look back, because as far as rookies go, unless it's Malik Neighbors or Marvin Harrison Jr., I think this is the guy that you're going to want to bet on in fantasy. Then, heading into round number eight, this is where I took running back of the Washington Commanders, Brian Robinson. Junior, and I will say for the situation, I will give this a thumbs up. Uh, considering I got him in the eighth round in a 14 teamer, because Brian Robinson Jr. I think is talented. Um, he has the skill set to be a three down back. That is something that he demonstrated last year. Now it is a bit concerning that they brought in Austin Eckler because Austin Eckler is more of a pass-catching back, so that will take out of his third-down role. And 
Ron Robinson Jr. actually is quite efficient in the passing game. And so his upside gets limited by that. He's splitting touches for sure. And then Jaden Daniels being as talented as he is in the run game and is going to score maybe like some of those rushing touchdowns. So you're seeing a limited view, but Brian Robinson Jr., I would not have to play him. I would not actually have to start this guy because I already have Pacheco, Cook, and Connor in the starting rotation. So with Brian Robinson Jr. sitting on my bench, I can actually see him maybe win out that role outright. Austin Eckler is on the come down in his career uh, last year. I think we, we saw a dip in production. We saw some injuries. I think if Austin Eckler is to sustain an injury, Brian Robinson will take a firm grip of this position, and uh, that'll be that. So I am willing to, you know, mess around and find out about how Brian Robinson Jr.'s fantasy outlook looks for this year. Since it is so low, I, I wouldn't want to actually have to play him, but I think that he has a he has a very skilled guy, and he has on the younger side. He's dealing with an older more washed running back, you could say. Uh, obviously, no one gave Austin Eckler the contract he was looking for. He has never been a guy who wants to get 300 touches, as he said, with LA. Uh, and, yeah, so I think that they're going to utilize him less. Um, and Brian Robinson is going to be, like, the primary back. Well, no splitting touches, but that primary back could evolve into a larger role if Eckler were to go down. So, I don't mind having him as like a high upside handcuff split touch type guy. Anyway, after that, moving into round nine, kind of a similar situation uh, where I drafted running back Chase Brown. Uh, There's another one where I'm I'm right here with it. I think that Chase Brown, he has the the ability to maybe take over this backfield. We saw early in camp that he was already edging out at Zach Moss for first team reps. And so Zach Moss was brought in from the Colts and he looks to be the starter. But Chase Brown, second year guy, I think that the team sees stuff in him and that's why he's been getting those first team reps. He is also on the younger side and I think that plays into his favor. So Chase Brown, he was I won't say that he really was doing anything to harm Joe Mixon last year. He was semi-involved, but I do think that he, at some point in this year, will take over, uh, take over the ship from Zach Moss. Now, it's not a situation where I want to be involved in early. I don't want to have to play Chase Brown, but yet again, a like very high upside handcuff type dude, where I think they're going to be splitting touches, and this one, it's not going to him in the primary role. I think that Zach Moss will be in the primary role, and we've seen him take over for Jonathan Taylor and do a great job, so maybe it doesn't pan out for Chase Brown fans, but I don't think that is the worst idea to just, like, wait and see. Then, heading into round 10, this is where I selected Josh Palmer off the Los Angeles Chargers, and the reason for this being, you know, Palmer is really the only guy that has an established connection with Justin Herbert on this offense. Everything else is brand new about it. Uh, between his running backs, his new wide receivers, uh, I guess maybe his tight end. But I want to say that even that has seen some change. So, uh, for chemistry, I think Josh Palmer is really that only guy that Herbert can depend on. Um, anything else he will have to train up, so... He is, looks to be a wide receiver too on that team. I don't mind him at this price, uh, all the way in the 10th round in a 14 team. I'm okay with it. Heading into round 11. Oh, sorry. Palmer, I'll give a thumbs up. I'll give Palmer a thumbs up. I like that pick. Then, uh, heading into round 11, I took Gabe Davis of the Jacksonville Jaguars. And I'll give this an okay. Gabe Davis in a very confusing wide receiver room where you've got Brian Thomas Jr., where you've got himself, where you've got Christian Kirk, and out of all these wide receivers, I think the most productive guy on that offense will end up being actually tight end Evan Ingram, so they'll all look to compete for these other touches in Dargan Um and Gabe Davis does have talent, you know, he 
has been able to outshine, outproduce um, Stefan Diggs in big moments and just at times going off for like four touchdown performances, nasty route running. Uh, I think that is not consistent, but he can be very good. And so, eleventh uh, round, it's a low investment. We can find out if he is going to be maybe the like. receiver, really, all three of those guys, Thomas Jr., Christian Kirk, and him, they could end up on top. I think Christian Kirk does have the best chance with the pre-established connection, um, and just the fact that he had a pretty good year two years ago, but you never know. Maybe Gabe Davis, they're all, like, wide receiver two, um, as far as, like, NFL standings, I think they're all, like, wide receiver two type talents very even playing field. Maybe he jumps up on the depth chart. We don't know. And then moving into round 13, 12. Moving into round 12. This is where I took my quarterback, and it is Geno Smith of the Seattle Seahawks. And I have to say, I do like this pick quite a bit, just because two years ago, we saw Geno Smith, and he finished as the overall quarterback 5 in fantasy. Um, and this year, we're seeing a lot of good improvements that's going to trend upwards for Gino. Uh, no more run first offense. B. Carroll is out. We have new offensive coordinator Ryan Grubb, who was running the show in Washington and having a lot of three wide receiver sets. So that means a lot more passing attempts, a lot more yardage coming Gino's way. And I, I think that he's going to feast. I think that his season is going to be some, more similar to what it was two years ago than it was it was last year, and I think that his price point is very low uh, in 14 team. I'm going to prioritize getting like good skill players because quarterback at the end of the day, they're going to put up good points. Uh, someone you're, you're going to be able to find someone at the very end who ends up in that like top 10 conversation that wasn't really being drafted. I feel like. Or at least was being drafted not in like the top 15th. And so, yeah, uh, I, I don't mind Gino for the upside that he has. He, in this draft, is going after dudes like. Caleb Williams. Uh, I mean, he's going after. had a solid year last year, but I think that the Geno Smith price tag in the 13th, 12th round, I, I was very okay with it, and I was happy to, you know, try and build, flesh out a good roster before trying to add a quarterback. It's it's 14 team. Anywho, after that, I did take an insurance policy on Geno Smith in case it doesn't pan out. This is where I took Justin Fields quarterback of the Steelers, and I like this pick only for the upside, the rushing upside. If Russell Wilson goes down, or if he gets beaten out, Justin Fields is a an elite runner from the quarterback position. The value he brings from the running aspect of his game is quite, quite high, and so being able to pick him up with essentially my last pick in the draft, I think that it can only do good things. So, yeah, I'm drafting a lot of, like, handcuff-type level, and I'm okay with that. It is a deep league. <laughs> you have to be creative in these 14 team leagues. And then with my second to last pick, I went with Jason Myers, kicker of the Seattle Seahawks, and then I had LA Chargers defense in my last pick. And LA Chargers defense is someone that I want to recommend for any of those streamers. If you're a defensive streaming type of person, I would go get them, just because their first three matchups is uh, Vegas, Carolina, and Pittsburgh. It's three quite easy matchups, potentially. At least the first two weeks, you've got like some of the worst quarterback situations as of last year. Uh, Minshew took over, so we don't have to worry about Aiden O'Connell, but Bryce Young and Gardner Minshew in your first two weeks, 
LA Chargers defense shouldn't have to be too afraid. Yeah, maybe they end up doing great, and maybe the Chargers defense is super porous, but those are easy matchups, and that's what you want to target. So I, if you're a streamer looking for easy first week scheduling, I think that the Chargers are the way to go. that first draft overall. I know that I gave a lot of mediocres, but this is what my final team looks like. We've got Geno Smith at QB, then Isaiah Pacheco and James Cook as my starting running backs, Tyreek Hill and Amari Cooper as my starting wide receivers, Brock Bowers at the tight end position. Two flex positions because this is a sleeper, uh, filled in by James Conner and Ladd McConkey. Then Jason Myers, defense, LA Chargers, and my bench looks like Brian Robinson Jr., Chase Brown, Josh Palmer, Gabe Davis, and Justin Fields. I am absolutely happy with this uh, in 14 team. I feel like both the bench and the starters, they give me a lot of flexibility in players that I like. I, I wasn't... <laughs> it's not ones that I'm like happy with necessarily.
Dante Smith to compete with. Jameer Gibbs, he does have that David Montgomery factor. Um, Buka has Cooper Cup. Um, Barkley has <laughs> Jay Leonard at the goal line. Kyron Williams. Kyron Williams is fine. But I, I think yeah, I wouldn't draft him that high. Nope. No way. And Jonathan Taylor. I don't love it. I don't know. I'm not really sold on his resurgence. And Anthony Richardson, I do think, is going to take away from some of his value. Anywho, uh, with that, we move into the second round, where I went with my first running back, and this is Travis Etienne. Travis Etienne, I'll give it a, a decent... I, I don't have anything in particular that I think is drawing me to him, but we saw him finish as the RB3 last year in fantasy uh, PPR he can run the ball he can catch the ball we saw Dank Biggs being taken pretty early in the draft um you know just served behind him but that role never really got carved out and with this offense I don't saying about him. I really haven't heard anything about Etienne. Whether he is a good pick or is a bad pick, he's one that just existed in my mind, kind of like an isolated guy. And so, I think that he's fine. I, I really don't think of anything positive or negative to say about him. I liked him more than Drake London, Marvin Harrison, or Devontae Adams. And I had already taken Derrick Henry Jr. Uh, Derrick Henry, so I figured may as well go out and get Travis Etienne. He does have that dual play ability, catch the ball, run the ball, and maybe he has that upside once again uh, to finish as high as he did. I don't think it's likely. I think that he does regress, but it is what it is. Has more good football left in him, and he is 
at the head of this backfield, so we're hoping to see a good offense. I think that it could be good, um, a good year for Mixon, maybe one of his last good years, but we'll find out. Then, round five this is where I took Amari Cooper once again, and as you know, I like Amari Cooper. I am happy with this pick. So, moving forward, going to round six, and I got my tight end here in Evan Ingram. And Evan Ingram, one of the guys that, like, if you can get him in the sixth round, please do it. He finished as the tight end two last year, had the most targets, had the most catches. Um, targets. I think targets per game he was slightly behind DJ Hawkinson, but DJ Hawkinson um, it was like 6.5 or 6.4 and yeah, the volume that this guy sees, I think that it's, with no Calvin Ridley in picture, he, he really is the best guy on that offense for Trevor Lawrence to target and it's just crazy that he finished as the tight end 5 two years ago and then tight end 2 last year and there's no reason to not bet on him but he's getting taken so far after some of these guys like uh, what Laporta in round 2 is crazy Travis Kelsey kind of a down year round 3 then Mark Andrews, Dre McBride Kyle Pitts, Kittle, Kincaid all up the board before Ingram and I feel like Ingram has definite top 5 upside so if I see him in the 6th I'm taking him every time um Honestly, it's just I don't get to see him in the sixth that often, but seriously, I would consider taking him. He's he's uh he's a guy that I'm high on. Like him more than Pitts, like him more than Kincaid, like him more than Kittle. Uh, yeah. Anyway, after that, moving into round. as a QB5 last year in fantasy. He had 4,000 yards, 30 plus touchdowns, and you know, they're doing good things for him on the offensive side. Brought in Josh Jacobs, took out Aaron Jones, the wide receiver room, uh, Christian Watson supposed to be figuring out what's wrong with his legs, maybe getting more healthy, and we get to see here to Jaden Reed, Dontavian Wicks, uh, and then Romeo Dobbs already has been pretty good, but he develops even further. I think this offense is all ready to grow together as the youngest team, uh, youngest offense in the NFL. And, you know, Jordan Love just got that giant contract. He is going to do his best to ball out um, to make it seem like that money was worth it. So the pressure's on, and I don't think he's going to crack. He seems to be a pretty good option for a seventh. And, you know, it was a few, it was a few picks after Kyler Murray, so I thought, you know, may as well go with Jordan Love. I think that he is going to have a good year. He's not, he's not a dual threat quarterback like that, um, but from the pocket, especially on the tail end of last year, talented guy, and, uh, his price is pretty, pretty fair for what he is able to achieve. Some people are high on him. I'm not on that list of 
people. I don't like the Denver Broncos backfield. I think that they figured to be one of the best, sorry, one of the, one of the best bad offenses in the league. I think that they're going to struggle. I think that they're not going to be very good on the offensive side of the ball. I think that they're not going to have to use the run game all that much. And even of that group, I don't like it. I feel like it's going to be committee vibes. It's not going to be Javante Williams RB1 type season. Uh, I've seen some people with like crazy hot takes about Javante Williams, but personally, my own personal take or hot take, um, I'm fading him every time. I don't want any part of that Broncos backfield. Um, and yeah, so I want with Calvin Ridley. Anything I say about him is just cope. I really don't like this pick. Um, as I just in a in a whole uh, DeAndre Hopkins is slightly hurt and Will of us likes to throw the ball down the field. That's really all I can say, but anyhow, let's just move on. Moving into the next round, round nine, we go with Ty J Spears. Uh Ty J Spears and Jalen Warren. They are guys that if you're in the late rounds and you're looking for efficient pass catching guys who have PPR upside. These are good picks. You can get them in round 8, round 9, um, maybe even round 10, and it's a good place for them to be because they are those like split touch type dudes where if the first guy goes down, they're going to see a lot of volume, and they already are the preferred option in fantasy, I think, because of their their involvement in the passing game. I figure Tony Pollard is going to be the first, second down back, and Spears is going to be brought in for the third down. And honestly, like, if Spears was able to make a name for himself, at least somewhat in fantasy uh, last year with Derrick Henry, <laughs> that should be no problem taking touches away from Tony Bollard. <laughs> After that, Seek out Elliot, phased him out of the offense, then failed to keep it. 
Tony Pollard or give him the role that he wanted and brought Ezekiel Elliott right back. And so Elliott was, you know, fine on the Patriots. He had some weeks where he was surprisingly good in the passing game, but he's lost a step. He's not going to be as good. I feel like he's going to be worse than he was before. And Dowdle can very easily make a name for himself in this backfield and take over. So, yeah. Then in round 13, what with Ray Davis, Ray Davis of the Buffalo Bills, what you know about him? Uh, he is the guy that looks to be the RB2 on the depth chart for the Bills. Our rookie kind of just fighting it out for that spot. I don't think that he's going to carve any sort of role. He's a handcuff guy. Um, but I've heard positive things about him from camp and the name. I saw it and I was like, oh yeah. And he, one pick before him was Jalen Wright who got drafted. And I was like, really? <laughs> Jalen Wright is going to be the third running back in Miami. I can get a guy who uh, looks to be splitting touches. No, not splitting touches, but like RB2. Yeah, may as well. And then my last two picks, I've got Jason Sanders and I've got Philadelphia D Eagles defense. Uh, Eagles D, they got a lot of stars because of Howie Roseman. A lot of guys that you could like. And then Jason Sanders, been on the offense with your kicker. Miami's going to have a top five offense. And that means a lot of kicking points. So finally, my end result with this team, I've got Jordan Love, Travis Etienne, Joe Mixon, Gary Wilson, Debo Samuel, Evan Ingram, Amari Cooper, Kevin Calvin Ridley, Jason Sanders, Philadelphia Eagles, Tysha Spears, Romeo Dobbs, Aaron Rodgers, Rico Dowdle, Ray Davis. I think this team is mid. I think it's okay. I wouldn't be super excited with it. Uh, honestly, I'm moving a Romeo Dobbs into that starting flex position over Calvin Ridley. I don't like Ridley. Um, and I, I'm, I'm rocking with it, I guess. It's, the bench is just okay. I like the tight end position. Like prime time for him to have his.
his best year, breakout year. Um, he already has been like RB2 level, uh, and I think it, it looks to be a little bit better. More goal line touches this year, uh, overall better offense. Might be more involved in the passing game.